2020 was rough for all sorts of reasons, but it also brought forth some strange products like this one. I mean, would you ever expect them to release a third Cats and Dogs movie? Because let me tell you, I was not prepared to see another one of these again. If you followed me for long enough, you'd know that I covered the first two movies before. And while my reviewing style has changed some over the years, I still stand by what I've said of them. Cats and Dogs 1 was not very good as far as children's media is concerned, and the second one wasn't too much of an improvement. Yet the series announced a third movie in 2010, and it somehow kept its word by releasing one ten years later. Seriously, who was asking for another one of these? I can understand waiting for The Incredibles 2, but Cats and Dogs 3? Well, can we at least see who was responsible for this one? Oh god damn it! Yeah, it's the corny Stranger Danger creator. This franchise must have been desperate, and given that this movie is mostly direct-to-video, besides in the UK, my hopes for this thing are rock bottom, but can it at least reach so bad it's good territory? Or will it make me sad like Agent Toby barks? Let's find out. So instead of following up with Mr. Tinkles' escape in the second movie, we cut to a decade later where all the spy groups are under a truce. We get a little exposition for the group responsible for keeping the peace between these factions. An organization called the Furry Animals Rivalry Termination. Or FART. <sighs> Bring out the fart guns. And because the story takes place ten years later, we have no mentions of any characters from the previous two movies. Instead, we have to settle on these two. Meet Roger the dog and Gwen the cat. They live in the same apartment block and with their respective humans, Max and Zoe. The former is an aspiring tennis player, while the latter is into music like her father. Run, run, run. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, the thing is, I wrote the lyrics down on a napkin, and then I forgot, and then I blew my nose, and then I put it in my pocket, and then it was just a mushy, snotty, gooey... Okay, so her father's a bit of a washout. I'm sure it'll be fine. I'm sure they'll find a way to avoid eviction. Bye, Gwen. Have a good day. Eh, yeah, that's fine. Now, despite the two pets working with one another, their owners do not get along. That's not a problem, though, since Roger and Gwen can use secret passages to reach their animal base. As you may have guessed, we are not your average pets. We're two of the baddest, most kick-butt fart agents you've ever seen. Who were you talking to? I know you were the narrators earlier, but this is you speaking now? Like the other Cats and Dogs movies, you must be talking aloud since your mouths are flapping non-stop. And to be clear, these two aren't field agents. They're just lowly risk assessment analysts. Gwen wishes she was out on the field, but instead she's working with Old Ed, voiced by Gary Chalk. I shift, Old Ed. Well, back's a little stiff. I've been meaning to order one of those standing desks. <laughs> ah, roast beef. Not sure if better or worse than the time he was in Ninja Turtles, The Next Mutation. It's a close competition, but the tiebreaker comes when Gwen notices this one dog doing something mighty suspicious. Ah, oh, not the diaper, not the diaper! And the diaper. Ugh, oh, 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 I'm gonna be sick. Yeah, this is worse than Next Mutation. Well, suddenly the base starts losing power. That means the plot is finally happening. In case you're wondering, this is not a power failure, but failure is the perfect word to describe what's just happened to your elaborate monitoring system. I've shut down all communications from your headquarters to every other station in your network. Just try and control your fart now. Ugh, will you stop with the fart jokes? Anyway, whoever this villain is, tells our heroes of his plan to sow chaos among dogs and cats. We don't know what it is just yet, but all we know through these random stock videos is that they're all mildly annoyed with one another. 
This obviously cannot stand, so the pets get ready for action, but not before cutting over to the unrelated human characters. The family in the first movie had some relevance because the father was working on something that the cats wanted. In the second movie, we saw Shane trying to get the main dog character a new home after the latter bungled a police operation. The story would have proceeded more smoothly if we didn't need to cut back to these humans who have no plot relevance whatsoever. But funny enough, the human stuff is more interesting so far, since our heroes won't stop fighting each other. Man's best friend. Period. That's four words. Catnap! <laughs> Where were we? Anyway, they end up picking up a landline phone from their chief, Schnauzer, who says... But a crime like this has Mr. Tinkles and Kitty Galore written all over it. Okay, so there's our confirmation that this is still in continuity. Though with how long the time gap is between movies, would Tinkles even be alive at this point? Either way, our heroes are told to eat some test food to try and undo whatever is causing them to argue with one another. It seems to work, but maybe a little too well. I owe you an apology. Apology accepted. Ooh, your coat is so soft. And your breath smells like freshly mowed grass. Also, Roger, Gwen, and their colleagues are the only ones who can figure things out since the attack occurred in their jurisdiction. Convenient. I mean, it's not like the villains are gonna spread chaos amongst dogs and cats from elsewhere, right? So our heroes need to put a team together, but they're really picky as to who can join them. Or let me clarify, Gwen is being as picky as hell. That just leaves... Looks like we found our muscle. Scared to death of that guy, by the way. Are you sure you're not still affected by whatever the villain did to you at all? Speaking of, it's time we get to know him. Here he is, Pedro, voiced by George Lopez. He's a cockatoo who can't fly well due to his clipped wings. You're new to our organization. Pets with out of the ordinary pedigree or poop for short. Owner clips my wings to keep me from flying off my perch. Tell me, wise guy, you plan on going to a loving family soon? You know, there was a villainous cockatoo in both Rio movies, and George Lopez also happens to voice one of the main supporting characters there. I guess this is what happens when George tries to voice Nigel, but even Nigel was way cooler than this guy. Listen, Ten Legs. Do you know how many puppies and kittens have found homes during that time? I had it all. A TV show. Women, too. I was tall. Over one foot two. Then they got a pretty parakeet to fill my shoe. That's why I am so evil, why I do what I do. So Pedro runs his own little group called Kaka, a team of animals that get passed up for adoption because, well, they're not dogs or cats. And while that concept has potential, the overall execution is left to be desired. There is no indication that this parrot has the super hacker experience to hijack Fart's computer network. He's been living in the same pet store for many years, so how does he know all this? Well, I guess it has to do with Paul Dobson Lizard here, who I guess is the hacker of the group, as he was able to use satellite waves to make cats and dogs misbehave. Soon, they will be rejected too. Abandoned by their humans, and they will feel what it is like to be unwanted. Throats Again, not a bad idea for this kind of series, but the film really fails to make things interesting. Anyway, the pets finally start their field operation, even though Roger prefers to work inside the office. Gwen also panics upon realizing the lack of any defined space. Guess she really likes walls and boundaries. Also, Animal control, five o'clock, and it's heading right at you. Um, no, it's moving away from you. The perspective clearly shows this, yet in the next moment, it's driving toward their apartment building. Oh, it's actually an ice cream truck. False alarm. Stupid old man mixing up his vehicles. And as they go investigate, I can't believe I'm about to say this, I'm starting to miss the previous two movies from this series. 
At least the animals there were running around with spy gear instead of just... nothing. So Roger runs into a police shepherd, who apparently can drive his own police car, about an informant who might know more about this situation. But when our hero talks to her, things become awkward and she only leads the team to some alley cats instead. We get some minor human updates, along with the animal pandemic, and somehow this causes people to buy animals out of Pedro's pet shop? You mean to tell me that the villain succeeded? Now what about the fish? Fish don't count. And no reaction from the animals about this? No connection to this phenomenon? No. Instead, we get the reason why Roger doesn't like field work anymore. There was a moment, there's always a moment, and I hesitated. My partner, my mentor, got hurt. I've never gotten over it. But listen, we can't forget that a pet's number one job is to be there for their humans. Well, that's poorly thought out. Even worse is how our pets go on about their human owners, and how their daily lives need to change. I guess it's commentary on how everyone is online these days and they never do anything with their pets. Oh, bite me, McNamara. Our heroes finally make it to the alley cat place, but Gwen chickens out due to how scary this whole thing is. And you know what makes things even creepier? Neon lighting in the background! Dead mice, filth upon filth. <laughs> Over oh, here. Elon Musk? Oh, don't bring up that Tony Stark wannabe. So after a lot of bumbling around, one cat admits to hacking a phone company just to get free internet for the client. That's all. And in the meantime, more cats and dogs have been returned by the millions? Humans are returning their cats and dogs by the millions. Look, this is a silly spy animal film that's had unnormal things happen in it. But even by the standards of the previous movies, this just sounds completely implausible! Anyway, after trying to find out who would hurt both sides, our heroes agree that it has to be a non-cat slash dog, and that they're using phone signals to affect the other animals. I knew technology was evil. Shut up, Roger! Meanwhile, Pedro is trying to look... intimidating, but he can't! But Paul Dobson Lizard tells him that he... made him a robot dog suit? What? I must test the full capabilities of this machine. Let's see. What does this one do? <sighs> Even Tinkles and Kitty Galore are laughing at how silly he is. And how is there still 40 minutes left? Oh right, we still have to shoehorn in the human stuff that has nothing to do with the main story. We cut to Roger dealing with his overbearing mother, while Zoe and her father are preparing to move to a smaller apartment. Here's when the pets decide to intervene, by trapping the two kids in the elevator without their phones and forcing them to talk to one another. I thought you like ate, drank, and played tennis with every inch of your soul. <laughs> yeah, well I thought I did too. I mean, I even named my dog Roger, after Federer. You, you have a cat, right? Gwen. As in Stefani. Oh, and I guess that ice cream truck was a plot point since it keeps showing up. Ed investigates and gets kidnapped. He has been watching us this whole time. Just, just playing with us. We're in over our head with this guy. He's in complete command. Whoa, 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 gas! No, way, brakes! Oh, no! A roundabout. These things always confuse me! I miss the first two movies. You hear me? Because those movies did more to showcase what spy animals can do, unlike this crap! I guess the other dogs were aware of the kidnapping, and they do that 101 Dalmatians howling thing to locate where their friend is going. Roger rescues Ed, and we learn a moral that we already know. Roger, there will be a moment. There's always a moment that you'll need to make a split-second decision. Don't hesitate. Meanwhile, the kids are still trapped in the elevator, and Max has to pee. What do you have planned in the summer? Uh, I'm supposed to go to a tennis camp, but, you know, recently... Uh, what are you doing? I'm going whitewater rafting with my dad. I'm living <sighs> out on the water. In the water? Anything water-related, really. I'm gonna pee right here! I feel like people assume things about others, you know? 
For sure. I mean, it's like no one actually really talks anymore. It's probably the longest I've gone without being on my phone. And again, it's back to the theme of people no longer talking to one another and being on their phones instead. Like, seriously? I know that technology has changed socializing forever, but can't this film acknowledge some of the good that came with it? I mean, we can talk to just about anyone in the world now, and these interactions can be as eye-opening or meaningful as being face-to-face. -face. One can even take in new perspectives and experiences that one couldn't otherwise. So not only does this forced lesson of the day feel so irrelevant to the story, it feels like an opportunity for McNamara or whoever to make fun of them kids these days. So thanks for ruining what little good that human subplot had going, but let's get back to the plot. After chatting for a bit, Max realizes he's trying way too hard to reach his goals, since he's been ignoring Roger in the process. Zoe also comes to the conclusion that she's been trying too little to cultivate her musical talent, so she plays a song to get the attention of anyone who could help the two kids escape. Back with the animals, our heroes can't get inside the pet store, but the baddies decide to let them in to spring a trap. Good thing nobody notices these random animals walking in without any owners. Anyway, it's time for Pedro to show off his Superman vest. Maybe he's the Snyder Superman. Who knows? Perhaps you'll remember me. After all, I watched you, Roger, get adopted from this very store. Not, not ringing any bells. Really? I was in the cage right across from you. Nope. I told you knock-knock jokes on occasion. Still nothing. I mean, I was right in the cage. But why? <clears throat> why wouldn't I? After all you've done to us. What we've done? And now it's time to pay. So, you're just bitter that cats and dogs got picked over you? Despite this being completely out of their control? Sounds more like you hate the humans for never accepting you, so why are you so hell-bent on ruining the lives of other animals? So Pedro and Zeke the Lizard release everyone to attack our heroes. But given how these minions are kind of slow, I'm not sure they're not all that dangerous. Out came the rain and... <laughs> Get that thing away from me! I'm allergic to spiders! Well, that's just prime. Anyway, the kids finally get out of the elevator and get over to Max's place. He realizes that Roger is missing, and decides to track him down with the GPS on his collar. As for our heroes, they got their butts kicked by the bad guys, and are forced into crates destined for India. Remember when this series had animals who knew Kung Fu, and we could actually see them? Of course, now is the time for Roger to ask why Pedro is doing this. While you cats and dogs were keeping the peace with your worldwide fart system, rest of us pets sat day after day, month after month, and in my case, year after year, waiting for human owners that never came. Again, blame the humans. Don't involve innocent animals, even if they have their own problems that are non-related. This movie is dumb. Thankfully, Max and Zoe force their way inside. I guess the store owner is too busy on his phone or something. But this means the villains will switch to a radio frequency that hurts the humans. You know, you could have done that to the humans instead, or find a way to brainwash them into buying you. Just saying, Roger decides to Kool-Aid man his way out of the crate after seeing Max get hurt. Duke also breaks Gwen out of her crate after overcoming his fears. You really care about them that much? We would do anything for them. That's what pets do. Just like they would do anything for us. But just as it seems like we're gonna have a final battle between our heroes and these CGI Cobras, this little kid from earlier just shows up and pets Pedro. I guess it gives him some comfort after being in pain for so long, but it's enough to subdue our main villain. Yeah. So that leaves out the other bad guy, Zeke. Then again, he's voiced by Paul Dobson, so of course he's against our heroes. What are you doing? It's over. 
So hand me the phone and get ready for your new family. I don't want a family. And I don't want to be trapped in a tiny space being force-fed crickets. Okay, well then what do you want? I want it all. Reptiles once ruled the planet unopposed. We were here millions of years before dogs, before cats, before anyone. Well, at least they didn't cop out by just settling it with the power of friendship. So yeah, Zeke is the new bad guy. And he wants to rule the world because he thinks reptiles are superior to other animals. Not before fish. Fish, fish don't, don't count. count. Okay, I didn't say anything about this earlier, but I don't get the fish hate in this movie. This beef is never explained despite fish being cared for like any other pets. So how do they not count? Zeke then sets the frequency to hurt birds. So this gives Roger the opening to do this. Okay, that was funny. Gwen takes care of the two cobras by just smacking them once together. And Duke takes care of the tarantula by stepping on it. Not enough to kill it, just enough to hurt her bad. Pedro then snags the phone away and erases all the frequencies that could be used to hurt anyone. Hooray. The kids decide to go home because... The GPS isn't showing them Roger. And we learn that Roger's old mentor was actually Ed. So, I guess he doesn't need to feel guilty about getting him hurt that one time? Who cares? Zeke and Pedro get arrested, but it seems like the good guys will at least find them owners who could take care of them. Zoe's dad then meets Max and gets inspired by his daughter's new song. I should stop when I had the chance. Michael well deserved rest. Like newfound confidence. So yeah, everyone gets a happy ending. Somewhat. Pedro is happy with his new family, while Zeke has to live in the Robo Dog. Me out of this thing? Not even funny. So I guess even Fart decided to abandon technology within their spy organization. Because when has technology ever been good to us? Sure, there's a time and a place for it in our lives. But we have to make a time and a place other things too. Well hot damn if this movie ain't pretentious. I didn't peg Sean McNamara to be some Luddite, but I guess he really wants kids to spend less time with fancy technology and spend more time with pets and people. And I honestly don't care about what he thinks on the matter because this movie sucks. I can actually say now that even the first two movies were high art compared to this crap. Those movies were at least consistent in terms of setting, with the high-tech spy world feel and all that. It's not an impressive effort of world building or anything, but it's miles better than what we get here, which is a poorly written PSA about the evils of technology and how the past was so much better without it. The less said about the animal sections, the better. The effects don't feel like they've changed much since the second Cats and Dogs movie, despite being done 10 years later. There is some charm in the human scenes, but they only exist to spread some anti-technology morals that make fun of them hippie youngsters who turned their backs on the good old days. It's just so grating since people still go outside and play with each other and their pets. The creators are just bitter that we have different conceptions of the good life that don't conform to their preferences. And it's just freaking insulting when they put more effort into this lesson than the actual story and characters who were bland and generic all around. I'm almost glad I waited till after the hiatus to review this because this would have put me in a worse mood in 2020. This is just crap that happens to associate with a niche IP which should have stayed dead. It has no worth being here. I'm the media hunter. Media is my prey and reviewing them my way. Okay.